The key starting point here is this idea that your origin in life should not dictate your destination. As a country, we are falling well short of that meritocratic ideal. Access to our top professions is severely restricted. Only about 10% of those from working class backgrounds make it into Britain's kind of higher managerial, professional, cultural occupations. But it's really important, I think, that we don't just fixate on this issue of access because it kind of gives the impression that the significance of our background somehow disappear once we enter the workplace. And so in our research, we wanted to shift the debate from getting into getting on. And what we found was really quite striking that in contemporary Britain, it quite literally pays to be privileged, even when those from working class backgrounds make it into these elite occupations. They go on to earn on average about six and a half thousand pounds less than colleagues whose parents did middle-class professional managerial jobs. Why, even when people are otherwise similar in every way we can measure, except for the fact that they come from different backgrounds, should they be earning less? We used about 300 in-depth interviews to try and understand what's explaining this class ceiling. That pulled out a number of common themes. The first is really this idea of the brute force of parental wealth. This kind of financial cushion provides those from privileged backgrounds with a really pivotal layer of insulation. From a lot of the uncertainties that are associated with forging a career in this country. The second key area is this idea of what we call informal sponsorship, where people who are in senior positions operating beneath the formal processes of a business act to fast track the careers of those that they take under their wing. And of course, everybody premises those sponsorship relationships on the basis of talent. But when you look at the genesis of those relationships, they were almost always rooted in some sort of element of cultural similarity, of cultural matching. The final area, and I think the most important one, is what we call misrecognition of merit. And this is the way in which fairly arbitrary behavioural codes relating to dress, relating to accent, relating to self-presentation, tend to govern who is seen to fit who has polish, who has gravitas, these kinds of phrases that are often used even in formal recruitment and progression processes. Thinking in the round about all of these factors, together they act as a kind of following wind for people from advantaged backgrounds, a kind of subtle propulsive power. Equally, those from working class backgrounds often feel that they have the wind against them. Not that they never get to the top, but that often it takes longer, happens less frequently. And also I think important to register is often a kind of fairly emotionally exhausting and difficult experience because often what those from working class backgrounds are being asked to do in these Lee occupations is to change fairly fundamental aspects of their identity in order to get on. There's no kind of silver bullet in relation to this type of inequality. It's tricky, it's embedded. Ideas of class are run throughout our history as a country. But there are important ways that employers can be part of the solution. First, just very basically on measurement, bringing class into the traditional ways that we measure and think about diversity and inclusion by using a kind of common and robust methodology, you can see really the extent of a problem and understand it in depth. In relation to this issue of sponsorship, what often we're talking about is a kind of need to formalize the informal, to make it harder for people to fast track their favorites. The trickiest issue is this misrecognition of merit what you really need to do is start a conversation within organisations about what you mean by merit, what you mean by talent, to dig into whether these sorts of arbitrary behavioural codes have any connection to work performance or competence. And where they don't, it's about trying to come to a more widely agreed upon idea of what talent and merit mean.
The final thing is that I think there is a limit to what employers can do around class inequality when they only conceive of class inequality in terms of who their staff are. It only really addresses this idea of the quality of opportunity, the fair allocation of rewards. And we need a broader understanding of class inequality, whereby organisations think about not just who they are, but what they do externally. For example, many professions are directly implicated in rising income inequality by driving high pay in the way they have over the last 30 years. But that sort of understanding of a wider conception of how an organisation contributes to class inequality, that's very rarely part of the conversation here. And I think there is a sense sometimes that organisational social mobility agendas act as a kind of form of cultural legitimation, allowing employers to align themselves to egalitarian values while obscuring the external ways they might actually perpetuate inequalities. A more productive approach is for employers to focus not just on social mobility but more broadly on class or socioeconomic inequality and it's interesting that we do have a kind of blueprint for that in the UK. It's called the socioeconomic duty and it was originally supposed to be part of the Equality Act. What that socioeconomic duty asks is that government and all public bodies have due regard for actually reducing inequalities of outcome. Successive governments have declined to bring that section of the Equality Act into effect, but perhaps it's high time that professions themselves step in to fill the gap.